sun, giver of life, burns most intensely at the equator. It powers a rich zone of life that crosses three continents and three oceans. Far more than a line on a map, the equator is a vital force of nature. The sun's immense energy is felt most powerfully at the equator. Each new day arrives with staggering speed, heralding the sun's heat and brilliance. But there is a cold equator, where the sun's warmth is challenged by snow and ice. Caught between opposing forces of heat and chill, animals and plants must adapt or die. But cold is also a life giver and an ally. Cold can bring great riches, and with the sun it powers evolution itself. In South America, the equator crosses a country which bears its name. In Ecuador, the sun faces an extreme challenge from the high peaks of the Andes Mountains. On the tops of Ecuador's volcanoes, it's as if the North Pole has come to the equator. These peaks are closer to the sun than anywhere at the equator, yet this is its coldest region. Here, a constant battle rages between hot and cold. Life must face nights that are like polar winter and days of hot equatorial summer. The early morning sun dries the coat of a newborn male vicunia. If he'd been born during the night, he would have frozen to death. Females give birth after dawn to give their young the best chance of life. Just two hours old, the young male can keep up with a herd. And so begins his first day in the mountains, where his enemy will be the climate, and his savior will be his woolen coat. Vicunia wool is among the warmest in the world. And like Vicunia's, some plants have woolen coats to keep warm, but they have another way of beating the cold. At dawn, the earth is frozen, but not the plants. Even though the sap is well below zero, it continues to flow. Sap doesn't freeze solid because it can be super cool. But the coming of morning and the sun's first kiss can be the kiss of death. Sunlight is the trigger for a leaf to photosynthesize, and for that it needs water. Sap begins flowing, but then it slows and stops. The plant is trapped. Its leaves are in the hot sun, but its roots are in the frozen earth. Just when things should be getting easier, 
the plant faces dehydration. An hour later, the earth is thawed and the plant can drink. The high Andes are a brutal place, but plants have suffered much harsher conditions in the past. The Andes felt the full force of the ice ages that gripped the planet. During the past two and a half million years, snow and glaciers advanced and invaded the lower slopes more than 20 times. Then each time temperatures rose, the ice retreated to the mountaintops. The peaks of these volcanoes at the equator remain in permanent ice, which is beyond the realm of life. Life begins a thousand meters down, where plants grow low for warmth. That is, except for chukiragua bushes. They stand tall, flaunting their orange flowers. And these flowers attract some unexpected visitors. The hill star is the highest altitude hummingbird in the world. Bird and plant rely on each other. The hill star needs regular nectar and the flowers need to be pollinated. This female's head is covered in chukiragua pollen. She's found a good supply of nectar. And she'll need the nectar if she's to raise her two chicks. To keep them warm when she's away, she's built a splendidly insulated nest, where they'll be snug even when she leaves them. These remarkable hummingbirds surviving close to the limits of life are birds of the tropics, and the tropics are not all that far away. Fifteen hundred meters downslope, it's 15 degrees warmer, warm enough for many hummingbirds. This male sparkling violet ear must drink nearly his own body weight in nectar each day. As he hovers to feed, his wings beat furiously at nearly 20 times a second. His nectar-fueled lifestyle is guaranteed up here. At the equator, there are no seasons, and there are always flowers. This valley of hummingbirds is also home to an animal that stepped out of the ice ages. This is a spectacled bear. It's a female, and she has a cub. These small bears are descended from giant meat-eating ancestors that roamed the Americas during the ice ages. Their descendants are plant eaters, with a passion that has earned the name Oso Acopoyero, the bromeliad eating bears. Bromeliads are perching plants. They sit up on branches like birds. But getting up there is no problem for the best climbing bear in the world. If a spectacle bear finds a tree with plenty of bromeliads, it may stay up there for days. They eat the base of the leaves and the highly nutritious heart. 
Hummingbirds are also big fans of bromeliads, which usually flower just once. On a single spike, tiny flowers open one after the other, giving several weeks' nectar supply to this glowing puff leg. A rainbow star frontlet feeds from an unusual bromeliad. Its flowers sprout on slender stems. Tropical birds and ice age bears, feeding on the same plants in the same forest. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Young bears climb from an early age. But it's a skill this male cub won't be using for long. Soon, he'll be bigger than his mother and too heavy to climb. Fully grown males are permanently grounded. And this one has found one of the bromeliads that's also grounded. It's called Puya, and it protects itself with needle sharp leaves. In this contest between animal and vegetable, the bear wins. He uses powerful jaws inherited from his long extinct ancestors to tear at the outer layers and get at the rich heart. Spectacle bears are the only bears in South America. They're rare, but they survive here at the equator between tropical heat and the icy cold of the Andes peaks where only the most highly adapted animals can survive. Up here, the air isn't just cold, it's thin and has little oxygen. This male vicuña leads a herd of females. He's alerted when a band of bachelor males enters their grazing area. He does not welcome intruders. The chase is on, but at four and a half thousand meters, each breath contains only half the oxygen it does at sea level. So how do Vicuña sprint at nearly 50 kilometers an hour when the air contains so little oxygen? A Vicuña uses all the oxygen in every breath. In the lungs, oxygen transfers to small, efficient and plentiful red blood cells. Vicuña have twice the concentration of red cells as human blood. The blood is thin and pumps rapidly out to hard-working muscles. Which means that vicuñas can lead furious lives at altitude. Having been evicted by the herd male, the bachelors set up a fight club. They spar in tests of strength that can last for hours. (laughs) 
They fight to prepare for the day when one of them will challenge the herd male to take over leadership of the females. A hill star hummingbird can't afford to waste energy. High altitude is a major trial for this little bird. The thin air up here makes it much harder to fly. So, unlike hummingbirds down in the forests that hover flapping their wings as they feed, the hill star must perch. Hovering is not an option at over 4,000 meters. Life at altitude throws up one more challenge. A challenge that comes from the sun. When the sun emerges from behind a cloud, the temperature can leap 20 degrees. But it's not just heat that increases, so does radiation. The sun is composed mainly of hydrogen gas and countless hydrogen bombs explode from its surface every second, sending vast surges of heat and radiation through empty space toward our planet. Directly in its path is the equator, absorbing the full force of ultraviolet radiation, which is 1,000 times higher than at the poles. Thankfully, the thick fogs that roll in through the day offer some protection. The weather is unpredictable. The equator doesn't have annual seasons, but the high Andes have all the seasons in one day. Dusk is the brief interlude between a day of summer and a night of deepest winter. And so begins the greatest challenge of all. The hillstar mother gives her babies their last feed of the day. She settles down and tucks them in well. Night pushes tiny hummingbirds to their limit. Roosting alone on a cliff face, a young female will survive by reducing her energy needs. She enters a state of overnight hibernation called torpor. The hummingbird's heart rate drops dramatically, and so does her temperature from 36 degrees to six. The night temperature hovers below zero. A mini ice age begins, but this stream doesn't freeze. It's the hunting ground of a small, fierce predator, the fishing mouse. The fishing mouse is small and hyperactive. She needs big meals, often. Eyes are of little use in the dark. She uses her whiskers to detect prey. Like the spectacle bear, the fishing mouse is an ice age survivor. This little mouse is one of an elite group of highly adapted animals of the cold equator. The hour before dawn, it's as chilly as it gets anywhere on the equator, but at least the cold is brief. The wintry night is limited to just 12 hours, so it doesn't push plants and animals beyond their tolerance. 
Then, as surely as day follows night, the sun brings relief from cold. But further west, it is cold that brings relief from the intense heat of the tropics. Out in the Pacific Ocean, the Humboldt Current, rich in food and minerals, moves up from Antarctica. If it fails to reach the Galapagos Islands, as it sometimes does, many animals will die. Boobies dive for food, but there's little reward. The heat is unrelenting. The ocean is as warm as a bath, and the fishing is poor. This pair of boobies was among the earliest to breed, but they're barely finding enough food for their surviving chick. They've staked the lives of their offspring on the rich waters of the Humboldt Current arriving soon. Other blue-footed boobies are gambling on the current arriving later. This pair is still in the early stages of courtship. Perhaps it's those with eggs that will succeed. For success depends on when the food arrives. Right now, only albatrosses can access the Humboldt Current, which is off the coast of Peru, 1,500 kilometers away. And that's where they fly on fishing trips. Good fishing within flying range is why albatrosses can nest here at the equator. For weeks before they begin nesting, albatrosses display to each other. These rituals help commit them to raising a chick, a task that will take them eight months. They must spend long periods apart. And while one remains on the nest, the other will fly away to find food. Hopefully, the flights will become shorter as good fishing grounds move closer to the Galapagos Islands. And good fishing is guaranteed in the rich Antarctic waters that are slowly moving north. During May, the sun and the trade winds push the Humboldt Current towards the Galapagos Islands. The leading edge of the current is marked by a cloud layer called the Garua. But it is still hundreds of kilometers away from the islands, where animals face trial by sun. As the sun moves across the sky, a booby turns away from its glare, creating a guano sundial. Some raise their feathers to catch a cool breeze. Chicks can find shade, but if the heat isn't enough for their parents, they have other problems. A young frigate bird attempts to steal food. Boobies are always alert for these aerial pirates. Frigate bird males display to attract females. They time their breeding to coincide with the boobies. These pirates depend on boobies for food. They also try to steal sticks for a nest. They will rob a fish or a stick right out of a booby's beak. But piracy is a risky way of life. Frigate birds will raise their chick only if they can steal food from the boobies. 
and the boobies are still waiting for the food from the current. They pant like dogs to keep cool. So do albatross, and they must also keep their eggs at constant temperature or their young will die. By mid-afternoon, even sun-loving iguanas are too hot. Marine iguanas are only found on the Galapagos Islands. They're tropical lizards, but even they risk overheating. They push their bodies up off the hot rocks to catch a breeze. When it gets too hot, sea lions go surfing. Days pass, little changes, except in the booby colony. For those who gambled on the cold current arriving sooner, the stakes have just got higher. What does the future hold for this chick? There might be food today, but will there be food tomorrow? When will the cold water arrive? And what if it doesn't arrive? This happens every few years when the sun changes ocean current patterns. In these years when the cold current does not arrive, the seas remain warm in the eastern Pacific around the Galapagos Islands. In the western Pacific, as far south as Australia, the waters become much cooler. These years are called El Nino. And on the Galapagos Islands, a year or more of warm, empty seas is disastrous. Sea lions and seal pups starve. Only scavengers do well. Boobies abandon their eggs, leaving them to the larva gulls. Those with chicks must remain. The larger chicks take all the food, and their smaller nestmates weaken and eventually die. Even marine iguanas face hard times. During El Nino, the algae they rely on disappears. And without the rich current to boost plant growth, they face starvation. In El Nino years, many iguanas die. But some cheat death by shrinking. They shrink their entire bodies, including skeleton, by nearly a quarter. Marine iguanas are one of the only animals in the world able to do this. In El Nino years, smaller iguanas can survive on less food. Shrinking is a most useful survival strategy on these unpredictable islands. Clouds hint that the Garua might be near. But it's come close before and failed. But this time, the clouds slowly build, a sure sign that change will happen. And it does. The cold water from Antarctica has arrived at the equator. The islands are plunged into a misty twilight. This is the Garua. And this is more like albatross weather.
suddenly there's more food. Both chicks in this nest will likely survive. The coming of the Garua is the beginning of an incredible time of plenty. The minerals in the cold current and the power of the sun are sparks that ignite a plankton explosion. Plankton grows so quickly and thickly, the waters become like thick soup and the light is dimmed. The plankton explosion is vast, so vast it spreads around the islands and beyond, blown to the west by trade winds. This plankton is like a vast, rich grassland of the sea that offers food for all. Enormous schools of salimas are the bonanza the Galapagos penguins have been waiting for. There's always a risk that the good times won't happen. But it's a worthwhile risk. For when you win, you win the jackpot. There's now plenty of food for iguanas. But getting it is not simple. These are tropical animals and the water out there is cool. The biggest males are first to take the plunge. Males might have enough body mass to survive the chill, but if they want food, they must dive for it. They survive cold waters by moving blood away from their body surface to essential organs. They also lower their heart rate. Minerals in the current greatly increase the growth of the algae they rely on. Iguanas snip the growth until it's as short as a newly mown lawn. But it grows fast. It'll be grazed again in just a few days. Being cold-blooded, he can endure the cold water for just two hours before returning to the shore and the sun. On the Galapagos Islands, sun, and cold water have created a unique sanctuary where strange creatures like marine iguanas have evolved. And it's not just iguanas. Just as strangely, the conditions suit cold water species like sea lions and penguins. These animals belong closer to polar regions, as do albatross. Cold water has made the Galapagos Islands like no other place at the equator. Further west, the sun heats the central Pacific Ocean until it's 30 degrees Celsius. This warmth causes massive evaporation. As moist air rises, it forms a thick cloud band at the equator. 
The rising air also sucks in wind from both northern and southern hemispheres to create the trade winds, one of the world's great wind systems. And where the winds collide, it rains almost every day. Palmyra Atoll is one of very few specks of land in the mid-Pacific. Here, different ocean currents create completely different conditions for life. Daily showers offer a coconut crab a drink. As water drips off its body, it uses tiny legs, normally for cleaning gills, to scoop it up. Coconut crabs are the largest land invertebrates in the world. They feed on coconuts, but they also scavenge for a living. Over a dozen different seabirds nest here, so they get to scavenge dead chicks. This giant crab has made a great success of life on land. But most creatures at Palmyra Atoll make their living underwater. The lagoon bustles with many kinds of fish and coral. A school of convict tangs graze algae nurtured by the sun. There are 18 different butterfly fish. Some so specialized they eat nothing but coral. So how did all these fish and corals reach this tiny atoll in the middle of an empty ocean? Beyond the island, the ocean appears barren. But there is fish life out here, but it cannot feed hungry seabirds. In fact, they fly out over a powerful ocean current that's full of fish. But the fish are very small. The current carries the larvae of fish, corals and other marine life halfway round the Pacific Ocean. And Palmyra Atoll is directly in their path. The ocean current that enriches Palmyra Atoll brings these seeds of life from the richest coral reefs in the world. And they are found further west along the equator. The equator passes north of Australia, close to Papua New Guinea. Among the many hundreds of islands at the edge of Southeast Asia are reefs whose riches are linked to our Ice Age past. And around the curiously shaped limestone islands of Raja Ampat are found the richest reefs of all. It's possible to see more than 200 different kinds of fish here on just one dive. And the variety is astounding. It's as if each family is trying to outdo others in outrageous design and color. With diversity comes deception and mimicry. There are close alliances and there is double cross. And always there is variety. There's even greater variety among the corals there are over 400 different kinds here. Their diversity is not just dazzling, it's confusing. And trying to understand their array traces these corals back to the planet's ice ages. 
Even now, fingers of cold reach among these islands. Just a thousand meters below these reefs of the sun, currents from the poles snake in deep channels. And where they upwell, they attract giants of the deep. Sunfish rise up from feeding grounds to warm up and be pampered. They're crawling with parasites that feed on blood and mucus and irritate their hosts. Reef fish swim out to relieve them of their irritation. The sunfish hovers as in a trance as fish tuck into a parasite banquet. Having been cleaned, the giants depart for the deep and the cold. And the cleaning gangs return to their reef that may be as old as the ice ages. A coral reef can be a hundred centuries old and as big as a city, yet it's created by tiny animals called polyps. Polyps use stinging tentacles to snare food from the current and draw it into their mouths. They also extract calcium salts from the water to construct their unique limestone homes. Polyps multiply by cloning, building limestone cities called coral heads that grow alongside one another to form reefs. Over time, reefs become vast, but size doesn't come just from a diet of plankton. The secret of their success arose hundreds of millions of years ago, when corals entered a special relationship with tiny plants to harness sunlight. And that partnership is renewed whenever these free-swimming algae colonize a new polyp. Once inside, the little aliens are recognized and instead of digesting them, the polyp absorbs them. And then moves them towards the light. In this partnership, the polyp provides nitrogen. And the packaged algae, now called zooxanthellae, harness sunlight to make sugars. And together, they build reefs. The huge limestone ramparts around the equator are created from a unique partnership between polyps and plants that's broken by the sun. Among all the corals, the most easy to identify are the branching staghorn corals, also called acropora but they're also the most confusing. There are 350 different acroporas based on shape, but based on their genes, there's only half that number. So why the difference? How many staghorns are there? In finding the answer to these questions, new light has been shone on the sex life of corals. Once a year, around a full moon, corals breed. The event is truly impressive, and it's changing ideas about how species evolve. On one night, many related species will spawn within a few hours of each other. Some produce eggs, others clouds of sperm. 
Corals can't move, so mass spawning is one way they can fertilize each other. But it's been recently discovered that different coral species can interbreed. Interbreeding occurs when the sperm from one species fertilizes the egg of another that's related. Interbreeding is unusual in nature, and the offspring is usually infertile. But coral hybrids can be fertile. And a coral hybrid can be a fast-track way to a new species, if they survive. Coral larvae soon face their first challenge, predators. If a young hybrid survives, ocean currents may take it far away from the reefs of Southeast Asia. As it travels, the larva grows into a swimming form called a planula. If a planula finds a new reef, it searches out a place to settle. Finding a space, it glues itself in position. As it develops, it absorbs algae, and with the help of the sun, it begins to grow into a new coral. A hybrid has traits from both parent species, and if they suit the new neighborhood, the hybrid will prosper. There have been periods when corals have had greater chances of producing hybrids. This occurred at different times when the Earth's orbit has altered, sending it further from the Sun and plunging our planet into the grip of ice ages. As ice sheets advanced from the poles, global sea levels fell by more than 100 metres. In southern Asia, many islands became joined and ocean currents rushed through the remaining channels with great power. Ice Age currents had enough force to send coral larvae great distances to far off reefs. When the ice melted, sea levels rose, currents weakened and corals stayed at home. With each Ice Age cycle, the process was repeated. Ice Age currents brought hybrids back to their home reefs where they reunited and reefs had fewer species. During the Ice Ages, the coral family tree takes on a different form. Every new branch is a new species, but when hybrids reunite, branches reconnect. And this rare ability of forming hybrids gives corals greater chances of success and gives these reefs of the sun far greater variety. At Raja Ampat, hybrids are helping solve the problem of knowing how many staghorn corals there really are. Staghorns that hybridize are now clustered into groups called superspecies. And what were hundreds of different species may be just 20 superspecies. So much simpler. But staghorns are just the beginning. Attention is now turning to fish. Are there superspecies among reef fish? One of the most likely families is the wrasses. They range from giants like the humphead wrasse to tiny cleaner wrasses that pick parasites off their willing clients. A juvenile rock mover wrasse looks nothing like its parents. And among the 185 species in this family, 
sex change is possible. This is a male crescent wrasse. He's blue now, but a year ago, he was a green female. Crescent wrasses are adaptable and resourceful. They sometimes leave the shelter of the reef and swim off in search of opportunities. And opportunities don't come much bigger than these six metre giants. Manta rays gather to be cleaned of parasites and crescent wrasse oblige. The cleaning complete, the manta rays return to feeding close to the richest reefs in the world. The interplay of sun and cold has helped create the most species-rich region of the equator. But diversity isn't just a feature of Southern Asia's coral reefs. It links all other regions around the equator that are home to more than half the world's plants and animals. The equator is far more than a line on a map. Here, the sun has created a unique circle of life. 